Yes. I mean, it's Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, I couldn't be more excited for this opportunity to share this amazing information with you. Uh, I appreciate those who attended my kind of introduction to the speaker series. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to our, our interns who are incredible and have been so kind as to have office hours every Tuesday from 12 to 2. And what office hours means is if you have an interest in coming in and learning more about the work we do or seeing the instruments we have, They'll be more than happy to kind of explain that to you. Um, if you want to share that information to others that are interested in learning more about the Institute, we welcome that. It's a, it's a great opportunity to get more information about our impact and yeah. And if you also want to do like a community collaboration or that is like resources for the health of the Institute, we would love to hear anything you want to do. Extremely creative and uh, amazing people to chat with. So if you'd like to come in and learn more, please do so. Again, that's every Tuesday from 12 to 2 p.m. And uh, yeah, very excited for that. Um, today, we have uh, Dr. James Brown, who just got his PhD from Arizona State University, where I met him. Um, yeah, I think that applies. 
Uh, being a plastic pollution researcher can be frustrating for me because I can give a talk that empowers a lot of people, but then I look around the world and I see that we're still surrounded by a lot of these things. And uh, what James works on is just so fascinating for me because he can actually replace things that might be more dangerous for us and he can replace it with something that's more sustainable, eco-friendly. And, and I really see this as being a strong part of our more eco-friendly future. And, and I get the question all the time, should we ban it, replace it, recycle it? And then I go to James and I say, hey, James, <laughs> what do we do about this? So I'm, I'm just overjoyed that he made the trip out to Maine from, from uh, Texas and uh, very excited to have him. Before James starts, um, I wanted to also highlight Louise Roy, who is one of our former Shaw Institute interns, is going to be giving the next talk. Uh, she's going to speak specifically about uh, PFAS contamination in Maine, how we got here, what's being done. Uh, she still works here. She's out in Augusta. So it's going to be a really wonderful uh, talk that she's going to give. We're very excited to have her. And then in August, we actually have Rosie Seaton from Allied Whale at uh, College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. So if you've heard anything about seal rescues around here, she's the one that's in charge of it. It's going to be a really fascinating talk. A lot of perspective just about what goes on in the state as it relates to marine mammals and conservation. So please feel free to join us for these events. We would love to have you. And uh, with that, I am excited to announce Dr. James Brown. Uh, thank you again for coming. Very excited for this talk. Thanks. Well, thanks for a, a very kind introduction, Charlie. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about some perspectives I've learned throughout graduate school and what I picked up um, at Arizona State University and Virginia Tech while I was kind of learning as much as I could about plastic in an attempt to kind of understand the problem we face and some ideas that we have to kind of uh, re remediate the situation we put ourselves in. Um, so to answer the question, what is most sustainable, I'll take the, the cop-out answer of it's pretty complicated. Um, so today we're going to first start off with turning this clicker on. All right. So I had the great opportunity to go to Arizona State University with my graduate school advisor, where we took a lot of the plastics research we start we did at Virginia Tech, and we kind of brought it to Arizona State University with the idea to design plastic with sustainability in mind. And instead of just addressing um, what can be the best plastic or what can be the best product, we wanted to ask ourselves, how can we do the best that plastic can do while having its end of life in mind and appreciating um, things we can do along the way to make it more sustainable from its molecular design to begin with. So today I'm gonna to talk about some things that I personally got to research in graduate school, but also I wanna highlight some of the exciting work I got to learn from a few colleagues I had while I was working at Arizona State University, as well as some of the people that just got to ASU that I'm very excited to follow some of the work and research that they're doing to solve these problems. So today, I'm going to be talking about some of the innovations in recycling and how we can look at the family of polymers of polyesters to improve chemical recycling, which we'll dive into a little more there. And then also looking at reactive compatibilization for some mixed waste recycling, um, kind of breaking that down to not all plastics the same, and we need to kind of figure out ways and strategies to recycle all of it together or to better separate it. And then finally, I'll talk about designing alternatives for some non-plastic chemicals, but still that ones that demonstrate a lot of toxic properties, those being a lot of starting materials for polyurethane foam. So everybody's nice and comfy in their seats today because we're sitting on a polyurethane foam. And historically, those have been used with some starting materials that have known to have some lasting health infect effects for those that work on producing these foams and all of these materials. Um, during their processing. So trying to replace a lot of uh, those toxic starting materials, as well as um, addressing some replacements for PFAS in specifically firefighting foams, uh, particularly looking at why PFAS is used to begin with, what made it so great at what it does, trying to answer that question so we can start to design materials to replace it as we eventually stop the use of it, um, since that's pretty likely to happen in the next five or so years of Kind of a lot of legislation removing the the use and production of fluorinated uh, surfactants since they've been known to cause such um, impact. So to kind of look at yourself as a polymer chemist and ask yourself how can we make this process a little more green? Some key tenants are 
how can we select the right reactions and look at the right atoms to put together in these large molecules to make it the most sustainable from our design of the molecule to our processing of it. And then ultimately yet yeah, design it for some sort of degradation in a controlled fashion where we can collect it and reprocess it. And then finally, how can we minimize some consumption and hazards, implement some circular economies and strategies to introduce how we can create a material circularity, and then finally minimize the energy input that we have in these processes. So most important message I'd like to deliver today is that not all plastic is the same and that it's pretty complicated when you look at all of the different plastic materials we have, where that's low density um, or linear low density polyethylene. And that's something you can think about your grocery bag is one of these low density polyethylenes where you have these long molecules that have some branches coming off of them. And then you have polypropylene, where if you think about um, like a pill bottle or something that is a little more stiff or firm, um, polypropylene tends to be very commonly used, again, in a very common contaminant uh, of dishwasher and laundry detergent bottles are primarily polypropylene. And then, of course, we have high density polyethylene, which uh, your tube of toothpaste is probably an HDPE. And then PET, which is everybody doesn't like the water bottles. They're primarily made out of PET. And that's a large waste stream that is a single use plastic in both packaging and water bottles. So looking at these colors here, having the, the blue being widely recycled and what is actually put into the recycling stream by consumers. Um, and then the yellow and red are simply not very recycled or can't be recycled. A lot of the issue with grocery bags is when they get put into the recycling stream, they get taken out because they clog up a lot of the machinery that's used to separate things. So the shopping bags, while materially may be recyclable, the actual form that they're in at the time messes with the infrastructure that we have. So they tend to not be recyclable. So as a materials scientist and something that um, I wanna look at it where I can help is how are the, you guys as the community and as society already helping our job out to recycle things and what are you guys already giving us to start to look at to recycle. So when you consider those three large waste streams, polypropylene, polyethylene, or polyesters, it's important to know these are all not the same uh, material and just like oil and water, they don't like to mix with each other because they're not the same. So if you look at this down on, on a really small length scale, um, kind of, excuse me, in this cartoon, um, where we have about micron sized particles inside of this mixture, that's only about, you know, a, a hundred times thinner than the size of your hair, but having such a small particle instead of a continuous phase ultimately impacts all of its properties. So you end up, when you take these mixed waste recycling streams and try to mix them all together, you end up with a material that's brittle and doesn't really do what plastic is, is so great at doing to begin with. And then you also can't separate these because they have really high viscosities, so you can't really pull them apart from each other. And you, we don't have enough time to wait for them to settle down like oil and water do. That would take millions and millions of years. So we need to figure out some way that we can overcome this issue, either by designing materials differently or by trying to find out something that we can do to accommodate this lack of mixing. So on the first avenue there where we're trying to improve the separation on the molecular level. Here we can think about designing materials that we can degrade in a controlled manner. And then it's easier to separate a small molecule than a very large molecule of which your plastics are made out of. So if we can bring these back down to small molecules in controlled settings, we'll be able to collect that and repolymerize it from kind of a, what likes to be called from the cradle to grave perspective of how can we get these polymers, bring them back and turn them back into monomers to remake. And then also we can try to figure out how to get these polymers to like each other a little more so that we can improve the material properties. So then we'll be talking about some reactive compatibilizers and how we can design those. So a little bit of chemistry up here, just um, I like my pretty shapes, but if they don't mean much to you, that's okay. You can feel free to ask a question. Um, but the main thing I wanna cover on this slide is that's the chemical structure of PET water bottles. And right here, this ester linkage is really easy to take apart if you treat it just right, where it's stable for the most part in the environment, which is why you don't see plastic water bottles degrade. When you have a controlled setting and you have clean PET, it's, it's pretty efficient and energy 
and, and low energy intensive um, and a very efficient process to depolymerize this molecule just by breaking this ester bond. And then we're able to collect that catalyst that we use and then purify the things we degraded it into and then repolymerize it. So PET is a very common commodity polyester, but the ester bond is a very easy thing to make, just like it's a very easy thing to unmake. So if we can design other materials with this ester linkage in it, then we can start to think about ways to chemically recycle more than just our plastic water bottles. But it is exciting to know that there are very effective strategies to recycle plastic water bottles if you can actually get them to people that know how to recycle them. So with that in mind, some limitations in that process at the time is PET, although it looks clear, inside of it has a bunch of very small crystals that are all held together by the very long molecules of PET um, within your water bottle. And so when you go through that degradation process, what ends up happening is you degrade a lot of the polymers holding all of the crystallites together, but the crystals are still stable because the, um, all of the products that go in there to degrade it um, aren't able to get into the crystals. So to look into an area where we can address this lack of degradation further, a research project I did was try to design a polyester with, again, slightly different than PET, but we still see that it has these ester bonds, but by incorporating um, this functional group and this functional group, which are a little different and a little stiffer, now we're able to try to make a material that has the advantageous process of having those uh, crystallites in the PET, but without having the issue of having those crystallites so that we're able to fully degrade it is the hope. Um, so another fun slide making things um, and just the synthetic process that we use where there's not much loss of material here, there's no solvents, and we're simply able to mix two materials together and pull off um, one of the products that con condenses and we collect that in a distillation arm so that we can use it in the future to make more monomers itself. But as you can see here, when you have none of this anti-crystallizing um, starting material in there, which we'll call DMOB, when there's no DMOB, we make very crystalline polymers. And you can see that because it's white and those crystals are so big, you're actually able to see them with your visible eyes. But then when we go to 25, 50, 75, and 100, you can see that it looks like we've removed a lot of those crystallites and we've moved to amorphous polymers. However, excuse me, the thing with these small crystals is sometimes we can't see them with our eyes. So we can look for another technique to quantify um, how many crystals are in there. Um, so essentially this unit on the left is quantifying how many crystallites were melting as we heated this up. And then what we can see is that when we have 50% of this um, anti-crystallizing monomer in there, um, we're able to remove all of the crystallinity while maintaining a, a plastic that has a glass transition temperature above 100. And what that means is it's not going to flow um, and it's not going to melt and it's not going to fall apart if it's being heated to 100. Whereas if you ever have put a PET water bottle in boiling water, you know that it kind of shrinks up a little bit. So these materials are about our temp stable at similar temperatures to PET, but without having those crystallites may be a little better for the chemical recycling process. And then, so we're still looking forward to um, some of the results for trying to recycle this in those processes, but that's the, for posterity's sake at ASU, I unfortunately had to leave and, and move on with my life. Mm -hmm. um, but so what I, we wanted to do, one of our other students and collaborators that we got to hang out with at ASU, um, Anastasia here on the left, and that's my advisor, uh, Dr. Tim Long on the right, a project that I worked on with Anastasia was incorporating that same idea, can we put a degradable ester into a polymer to help with this chemical degradation process, but we wanted to expand this chemistry to polyethylene. Um, so if we can make a polyethylene that can be chemically recycled, our hope is that by introducing ester linkages in stable polyethylene um, polymers where polyethylene doesn't really have very simple degradation pathways, we're then able to develop some sort of a circular economy where you have this mixed plastic feedstock and you can put it all together in the Volcat process and you'll be able to depolymerize both the polyethylene and the PET to molecular weights where we're now able to separate them a little more effectively while still maintaining the properties of polyethylene so that we can use polyethylene where polyethylene needs to be used. 
So by incorporating those degradable sites within our polyethylene black backbone here, these blue rectangles are non-degradable polyethylene, and then the white sections are those ester bonds that we're able to take apart when we want to take them apart. And so something that you can benefit from in this polyethylene cycle is if these are a low enough molecular weight to be separated, but they can still be a high enough molecular weight to not require the same amount of energy to make uh, to repolymerize them, then we're using less energy in this process also. So it's about finding the right molecular weight that can be separated, but also still give us the right uh, mechanical properties. So a little more chemistry she did, but this is what that polycondensation process I was talking about looks like. Um, where we're simply taking uh, a mixture of these two starting materials and we melt them together and then we're able to take them and squish them together between some hot plates and we end up with these really nice polyethylene films uh, that now have these ester linkages put inside of them to degrade them. And it's always important when you're trying to replace something to make sure that you can get some of the same material properties out that you are expecting. So when you look at this black HDPE control on our stress versus strain plot here, strain being how far can you stretch it, stress being how hard is it to stretch it that far. Um, and then, so what we'll see is that without any um, of the poly, with a 48 weight percent of our polyethylene polyester, we have pretty bad material properties. But when we move up to a 95 weight percent of our polyethylene polyester in this copolymer that Anastasia synthesized, we're able to get to a higher um, elongation. We're not quite to HDP yet, but by following this similar trend, we know that a lot of the material properties are maintained in this process. And for most applications for polyethylene of this type, we don't need to get much further than this. So a little bit of sacrifice on the maximum performance that we would need from this material, but understanding that most things are, are down below this 100% strain for what polyethylene is used. And so to kind of make this percent strain plot make a little more sense at 500% strain, that's where if you had your material and it was one centimeter, you were able to stretch it to five centimeters. So pretty stretchy, even at 400% strain where we were able to get. And then we also wanted to look into some of the other grades of polyethylene, how I was saying you have your grocery bag versus your tube of toothpaste. Can we make grocery bags out of the same process by incorporating these branches inside of it? So Anastasia developed some pretty um, exciting and novel chemistry as well to address this problem. And the other benefit of this is those branches do the same thing I was trying to do with my polyesters, where we're disrupting those small crystals inside of the polymer. And by disrupting the small crystals, we're again able to access a little more degradation just by changing uh, the chemical structure. So again, we're able to make these really nice um, films and they're a little colored because we don't put anything in there to any antioxidants to keep them clear, um, which is what is typically done um, commercially. But for the most part, um, the mechanical properties don't change uh, if it's colored or clear. And then so finally, what we'll see here is, again, as we try to beat this black line that we're getting closer um, by having those less of those crystallites, we're able to stretch it just a little bit further. And then finally, we wanted to see if we were able to take this material apart and bring it back to some sort of liquid we're able to separate. And by mixing it with um, in some acid um, and a solvent, we're able to degrade it into this separatable phase where we have the monomers we're trying to collect up top and then our solvent down below. And it's a lot easier to deal with at the smaller molecular weights. So I, I want to take a quick break throughout the talk before moving into the next section. If there's any questions on that idea for a, a depolymerization strategy for um, bringing the polyesters that we use, bringing them into a controlled environment where we can depolymerize them and then make new polyesters that are just as good as they were before. Yes. How to getting this into a system? Uh, our recycling system today. There's some in there clothing for us to make it, but they can't keep up with what's happening. And part of it is the chemicals that are in the waste stream. How, how close is this? So exactly. So that's sort of our part is to look at strategies for if we already have the, the materials. And so, well, the, the Volcat process is very well understood academically at the time. Um, 
for PET, IBM having a, a huge, powerful company behind owning this process. Um, IBM's trying to commercialize uh, Volcat pretty quickly so that they're able to start selling this sustainable process. And that'll develop some sort of an infrastructure where if somebody's going to buy the PET water bottles, they'll become naturally more incentive for people to try to collect them and try to bring them to someone who has the technology and the capability to produce a new product out of something. So if we can develop that sort of infrastructure where somebody's trying to buy something, people will try to start selling it. And hopefully that trickles down to the perspectives where uh, state legislation or any state people will want to say, all right, maybe we don't want to give up on recycling. Somebody says they can actually do it and we'll take our garbage for us. Um, so if we can continue to do our part and separate our waste, and bring the plastic water bottles to the right people and they're willing to pay us for it so they can make some money, then hopefully we start to see some action naturally occur um, just because there's an infrastructure in place now and that there's a little bit of hope that maybe right now only 10% is recycled, but with new technologies being developed, maybe we can get that to 20, 30%, and then another 10, 15 years, maybe it continues to, to increase. So. I think it's it's pretty easy to to spend some time doing something and only get so far, but it's important to to remember not to give up and to hope that there's some some futures to come. And as the new technologies increase, there'll be infrastructure to to provide these solutions. So hopefully, I hope it changes because now uh, people know how to recycle much better um, as chemists. Where before it was, we don't know what we're doing, so we're going to throw it away again. Where now we know what we're doing, so hopefully um, when we're given material to recycle, we actually can recycle it and develop that infrastructure, if that answers your question. There's hope. <laughs> yeah. This may be a little bit of an aside, but recently I read that uh, the humans are ingesting a great amount of plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm you know, thinking about water bottles and I'm thinking about plastic cutting boards where I see all of the yeah. lines and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any comments about the uh, yeah. use of the <laughs> A lot of the a lot of the microplastics won't come from drinking your water bottle. The um, like I was saying, that ester bond is, is pretty stable unless you're doing exactly the right thing to it, and that the conditions the plastic water bottle is in before you drink it, it's probably pretty clean water. The issue is when a plastic bottle goes into the environment when it wasn't recycled, then that starts to break down, and then the water system itself is polluted by. Uh, microplastics. And so the issue is the our waste of these is is generating microplastics due to just the natural wear and tear of the water bottles being smashed up against the beach or walked on, and then it rains into the water, where the material itself is chemically very robust and very stable. Um, but having it misused and thrown out into the environment and then decomposed by some sort of erosion process that introduces it into the water cycle and that's where it starts to build up. And then for cutting boards, um, don't use serrated blades on your plastic cutting boards is my, my one little, little tip. Um, but those plastic cutting boards are, are probably most likely made out of like a polypropylene, which is not very, there's really no studies out there to say that polypropylene has negative health effects. It's entirely chemically inert and your body is, is not going to interact with it in any significant way. And it's a very big particle relative to what your uh, material, microplastics are very large relative to what your body generally absorbs. So having something that is chemically inert and large, too large for your body to absorb it, most likely that small solid is gonna go where other solids go after you ingest it. And then most likely fine. <laughs> Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. A lot of research is happening in education. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that, that's a very great question. Um, a lot of it is there's a lot of work to bring these infrastructures that are being developed into um, the companies so that they can continue to make money off of these processes. And so it's something that 
excites me about polypropylene, I'm not talking about it today, but PNG, for example, they have, they make all of the, they buy all of the bottles that Tide Pod goes in, all the detergents. So they get a lot of pressure for, hey, PNG, why are all of our uh, detergent bottles in the ocean? So PNG has recently, and in, in I think four years ago, they, they um, patented their idea, what they call pure cycle, which is a very sophisticated separation technique that really be leaning towards how chemically inert polypropylene is they're able to scrub it away chemically from everything else and then recollect polypropylene in a clean way so png has a lot of exciting moves towards polypropylene recycling and then actually um a lot of that degradable polyethylene work is getting um some money from sabic which is a very large plastics in um, industry which is a, a Saudi Arabian company um, that has a, a good bit of money that they throw into the American education system for research. So there is that, that benefit of some of the companies trying to give back um, to research to try to understand how they can make their processes more cost effective. And so that's sort of the, the burden we bear is trying to, to get to that more cost effective strategy for uh, depolymerization and designing of, of polymers. So a lot of investment in research, but yeah, pure cycle of PNG is something that I'm excited about and I hope continues to gain traction. Yeah. Is there a limit to the number of times plastic can be recycled? We, the newspaper, I learned there is a limit. <laughs> so it depends on the process. If you're just trying to take a, a water bottle and melt it and, and reprocess it, Charlie actually showed you can do that like 15, 20 times with no effect when he was at um, our group at, at ASU. So there is a lot of, if it's a clean material, it can be recycled very, um, very readily. If it's a dirty material, that's where you kind of have to accept, if I try to just melt this and it's dirty, it's gonna be worse than what I put in. So that's where having that strategy to say, it's gonna fall apart anyways, let's make it fall apart all the way so we can separate it and rebuild it. And that process can be done as many times as possible, as long as the materials start to come in and that catalyst that is used is catalytic so we can recollect it. Um, so that chemical recycling strategy is in the, as many times as you can conceive if we can keep getting the plastic water bottles back. <laughs> So yeah, exciting. All right, so we'll, we'll take some other pauses for questions throughout. But so I don't, um, I'm very excited to kind of introduce these two new faculty members at Arizona State University. It's a, a couple coming to us um, from another group, um, Dr. Mark Hillmeyer, but these two are bringing a lot of the same philosophies and care that we brought to ASU um, and a lot of exciting research as well. So. Dr. Kate Sample on the left and Dr. Jeff Self on the right, um, looking at new ways to implement some of the chemistries we've done and have worked on into um, addressing recycling strategies as well. So I wanted to quickly highlight some of the work that Caitlin's up to that I'm very really excited about that I think is very promising for mixed waste recycling. Following that strategy of if this is all mixed together, how can we make it like each other a little more as for that other strategy. So here, what she was able to do was she was able to make this reactive polyethylene that was able to react with PET at the molten temperatures when you can get these both mixing together. And through that reaction of the, P, of the polyethylene with the PET, it actually helps compatibilize those two materials together so that they're more likely to interact and that you have less of these discrete um, phases of polyethylene and um, polyethylene terephthalate just through a simple addition of this reactive um, material. So by putting in that um, compatibilizer and mixing together uh, polyethylene terephthalate and the uh, low density polyethylene, you have this reaction that occurs from the uh, polyethylene phase to the PET phase. And as you cool it down, you've now put these really strong bonds between the polyethylene and the PET so that when you try to stretch it, it actually now has um, improved materials property compared to polyethylene by itself, or more importantly, when you just try to mix these two together without adding in this extra reactive polymer. And this is, again, not anything to worry about. It's large enough where it's not going to do anything 
um, in the body and it is made out of carbon-carbon bonds that don't have any negative impacts while inside. So these are some microscopy images where you can see on the top where we don't have that reactive compatibilizer. We see these really large phases of polyethylene within our PET, but upon an addition of that reactive um, compatibilizer, we see that these phases are very um, minimized and that we now have much better mixing between these two polymers that traditionally don't mix on their own. And then again, to quantify that, Again, the further you can stretch it, how hard it is to stretch it on the y-axis. This is just your regular PET, and then this green line is your low-density polyethylene. And then when you try to mix them together, you can see you, you can't stretch that even twice as far before it breaks. Um, however, when you put in small amounts as low as half a weight percent of this compatibilizer, so that's another exciting thing is compatibilizer technology prior to this this research really needed to get to higher weight percent incorporations, but by more or less having a reactive compatibilizer that becomes a larger weight percent compatibilizer through the reactions with the chemicals you're mixing together, we're able to get very improved properties of this blend just by putting in a small amount of this compatibilizer. So this jump from about 25% strain up to 350% strain very exciting um, on the work that Caitlin was doing while she was in her old group. So I'm very excited to hear what she's going to be doing now at ASU. And we'll take a quick pause. That was a little different than the depolymerization, but still in the mixed waste recycling uh, space. So if there's any questions before moving on to small molecule contaminants. Yeah. What impact does the compatibilizer have on the recyclability of the so that is a good question. Um, I'm not sure if she did any multiple recycling um, paths, but due to the equilibrium nature of the, the ester reaction where you have that OH group, that hydroxyl group react with the ester, once it's molten again, it most likely is going to continue to be in equilibrium and continue to be dynamic and maybe it'll break apart, but then it'll reform again. Um, so it's on paper, chemically speaking, it seems like it's a process that should be amenable to multiple recyclings as well. Alrighty, so now I'm gonna quickly talk about um, how we can think about replacing toxic chemicals. And the issue with replacing toxic chemicals is we always need to think about it in the, from the perspective of the thing we're making needs to do the same exact things the things we're replacing is which can often be difficult because the things that exist do what they do very well. So when we need to design a replacement, it's first very important to understand what we're trying to replace. And so one of my best friends, Jose here, um, another researcher at ASU, he looked into replacing isocyanates in those polyurethane foams that I was talking about earlier. And isocyanates are known to have a lot of those health, negative health effects for those working with isocyanates. So foaming insulation, a lot of construction work, all of that spray foam is riddled with a bunch of isocyanates that are small molecules, generally volatile, and that's why they're wearing masks. However, a lot of these isocyanates are small enough to get through those masks. So we want to make sure that there's nothing toxic from the start so that we can prevent all of that exposure during the production of, of these foams. So just a, a quick how it's made on polyurethanes with a bit of chemistry. Um, we'll animate through there. This N double bond C double bond O functionality here highlighted in red is the isocyanate we're talking about. And that's incredibly reactive. And then that is why it causes so many health effects is due to the reactivity of this isocyanate um, in your body, you tend to have a lot of negative health effects generated through the amine being present in your body and reacting with things upon its, its degradation. But what's important here on what the isocyanate does to begin with. So the isocyanate is really reactive with these um, hydroxyl groups, which form these urethane groups, the urethane being this NCO bond with the C double bond O group here. So we wanna make these urethanes and the urethanes are really great because they interact with other urethanes very strongly. And so you can get very robust materials through the interaction of of this urethane with another urethane because you have some hydrogen bonding, just like water has all of its hydrogen bonding and how that provides 
uh, a lot of improved material properties to ice when you can have it all frozen together. The polyurethane forms very strong hydrogen bonds that make your material very important. So the polyurethane is, um, the urethane bond itself is what makes the polyurethanes provide a lot of the material properties that they have. What's, what is good about existing technology in polyurethane foams is there's a lot of just natural materials that are used to make the foams. Um, we have a lot of sucrose and sorbitol, which are naturally sourced, and glycerol also naturally sourced. So a lot of these multifunctional alcohols are what's used to make the foams um, so that they don't flow and fall apart, but they can be nice and soft and, and comfortable. And so a lot of those technologies are used in the spray foam, in your car seat cushions, memory foam mattresses. Uh, the back of my cell phone case is a polyurethane. Polyurethanes are, are everywhere in a very commonly made material, but we want to make sure that we can remake the polyurethanes without using the isocyanate. So what Jose did was he, he followed some work in our group using this carbonyl diamidazole, which forms a similar very quick reaction with an alcohol. And then the other benefit here is that this imidazole leaves, and imidazole is a, a known, the effects of imidazole are very well known in the body, and it's at worst an allergen if you're allergic to it. However, it really doesn't have any bad toxic uh, products unless you have an allergy to it, which isn't as common um, for the general population. So we are also here with this carbonyl diamidazole able to make that urethane bond, which is the goal we were after. And then to make a foam, we also now have something volatile coming off that can help blow bubbles through this polymer as we're polymerizing it to make the, the soft and squishy foams um, that are very comfortable. So another example of those polymerizations, and here you can see all of that gas being released, all of that imidazole coming off. And again, imidazole is a solid at room temperature, so it's very easy to collect this product to remake uh, future starting materials because it doesn't escape because it's a solid at room temperature and it's easy to store, it's easy to collect. Um, so we're able to make these very flexible um, polyurethanes out of it. And so we wanted to apply this process to um, a, a set of starting materials that will make foams with having that multiple functionality. And what you can see here is we're able to make multiple different types of foams. This is a nice soft squishy foam, like something you're seating, sitting on. Whereas this is a very hard and rigid foam, which is something that you would want to have for a lightweight application that still needs to be tough. Um, and then a couple more exciting SEM pic pictures here where we're able to control the internal geometry of the foam, which uh, ultimately impacts is this a uh, hard foam or a soft foam. If these are all closed, it will be harder. But if you have some more, sorry, I thought this, I was on the next side. If some of your foams all connect with each other, that'll be softer. Um, so we're also able to make the foam sizes a little different by adding in a small amount of a surfactant and that destabilizes the foam so that we're able to control its geometry from these closed rigid cells to now having these open flexible foams where if you can imagine trying to squish down on that, there's a lot of room for air to go. So it will be softer and squishier, whereas there's not much room for air to go here. So that'll be harder and firmer. And so finally, um, I want to talk about the work that I did um, trying to explore alternatives for PFAS. And so here is, here's the bad guy. Um, here's PFAS, um, a starting material on its chemical structure level. So this is the surfactant that is put in firefighting foams historically at airports where a lot of contamination um, for PFAS started. And what happens is, although this material itself is not PFAS because it has this extra junk on the end of it starting at the nitrogen. What happens is when this is exposed to water or stored in water, this bond breaks very easily. And then you end up with these very stable fluorinated compounds, and then you get that sulfate group. So we know that the hydrolysis of this ionic head, is ionic because we got that positive and negative charge, just the fancy word for it has both charges on the same molecule. And then what makes PFAS so dangerous for the environment and so accumulative and what's been kind of linked to a lot of its health effects is the carbon fluorine bonds that happen and occur very readily within the structure of PFAS are very stable. They don't break down and it makes these carbon carbon bonds very inaccessible to break down also. So that's why these are called forever chemicals because there's nothing in nature that has any idea how to deal with the fluorinated backbone. It's 
There's no living beings that make fluorinated materials. Nature has never found a way to handle this quite yet. Given enough time, maybe it will, but we don't really want to wait and see if, if we can overcome the stability and toxicity of the fluorinated backbone. So we want to figure out how can we kind of improve on this system and replace the fluorinated material with something that is not toxic, maybe degradable in the environment or in your body, and ultimately, hopefully not cause any health effects. But before jumping all the way to a replacement that we know isn't toxic, we really don't know why PFAS is so great quite yet. Um, we know some things about it. And the main thing with aqueous film forming foams is having that fluorinated surfactant provides us with this aqueous film on top of our fuel layer. So if you're thinking about a fire, if you've got like, if you ever had a grease fire in your kitchen, you know that the oil floats on top of the water and that's why it's burning so much is that our oil is on our water. What is magical about the aqueous film forming flows through the uh, fluorinated surfactant is you have enough of a repulsive force from the oil and the water because again, the carbon fluorine bond is so unknown naturally that neither water nor oil like to mix with it. So you're able to actually spread this layer of water on top of the fuel. So instead of draining down because of gravity, you have enough repulsive forces at the molecular level where you're able to spread out um, that fluorinated um, surfactant containing foam. And by spreading out a layer of water over a burning fire on a molecular level, you're able to put it out. And so that's been pretty well known for a while, but we, what we haven't known is what the self-assembled structure in solution of fluorinated surfactants does, particularly what it does in the foam layer. So when you put out a fire, you really want this film to drain quickly and coat all of the fuel um, so that you can quickly put out the fire. But then what the foam is there for is to prevent fuel diffusion through the foam to prevent reignition because where the fire was is still pretty hot. And as fuel goes through the through, as fuel goes through the foam, you end up with a bunch of reignition that occurs. So we want to find out how we can design a foam to prevent reignition um, and how the self-assembled structure of the surfactants in solution affects it. So although PFAS is a very small molecule, it's not a plastic, it's not a polymer, because of all of the repulsive forces and all of the uh, physical interactions that occur, it forms different shapes, particularly with PFAS, you form these vesicles and possibly bilayers whereas other surfactants will only make uh, spherical surf, uh, micelles in solution. So if you think about like sodium dodecyl sulfate, SDS, sodium lauryl sulfate, all three of those describing the same soap that's probably on the back of every one of your um, water, all of your hair products or, or body washes, sodium dodecyl sulfates are very common uh, commodity soap that only forms spherical micelles and that's not good at putting out a, a, a foam. So we wanted to find out there's any specific effect of the self-assembled structure on fuel diffusion and foam stability. And along the way, we tried to, we, we did some research on how different surfactants will form different self-assembled shapes. And so there's a lot of great reading to be done about the geometry of a surfactant. This lovely cartoon where we have our water loving head and our water avoiding tail. So you can think about this all essentially as a little puzzle piece and by having a mathematical ratio of how big your tail is and how much area your head occupies, you're able to think about the shape that that surfactant might make. And so if I have a bunch of cones um, and I try to put them together, it's probably going to make a sphere. But if I have a bunch of uh, these cones without a point and I'm putting them together and they have to fill all that volume, there's gonna be a hollow space in the middle if I just try to make a circle. So if I make a rod out of this cone and I try to put that puzzle together, what you'll see is that we form these rod-like um, vesicles instead of a sphere. And then if we have a cylinder, then we're not able to make these rods and we're not able to make a sphere, but we just have to stack them right on top of each other. So that's, the math is not as important for, for today as much as what shape does this molecule occupy when it's dissolved and then how do those shapes fit together to make a bigger shape. And so I wanted to design some molecules that existed in this, in this shape so that we could increase the viscosity of our foam um, by having a more viscous foam, we were hoping to have a more stable foam. And so 
I made one surfactant with this bulky tail to get that truncated cone and another one with the same tail, but a different head. And I wanted to see what the effect of the Zwitter ionic functionality that PFAS has um, does compared to this other possible functionality where we just have a positive charge on it. And then our counter anion can do whatever it wants in solution. Um, but with the Zwitter ion, the positive and negative charge have to stay close to each other. And I wanted to see what that did to the foam properties. And we were able to scale this up pretty readily, show that it would be commercially viable if, if it was picked up, um, that there's a lot of uh, possibilities for um, its synthesis and that we were able to purify it and isolate it very easily. And then we wanted to see if we made the right shape surfactant. So this is a transmission electron microscope image. So very small here, we're down at hundred nanometers which is four times smaller than the smallest length scale of light that we're able to see with our eyes. So this is very small stuff. Um, but what we can see is that the self-assembled shapes do form these worms. And if you stare at it long enough, you can see that there are some black spots that continue a little further and overlap with each other. We also see that there's these aggregates in our, in our TEM sample. Um, and then we wanted to quantify the stability of our foam. So here, this is just tracking how tall our foam is after we made the foam. So this black dotted line looks at the foam and the black solid line looks at the liquid for these Witter ionic surfactants. So this is more similar to PFAS. So this is doing what PFAS likely does by itself. Where here we see um, a very fast drainage compared to the cationic surfactant. And so if you think about all going all the way back to the beginning there, how we wanted to deploy that layer of water on top of the burning fuel, having this Witter ionic functionality helped PFAS drain quickly so that it could put all of that water on top of the fuel to begin with. So in our quest to understand what aspect of PFAS made it do which part of PFAS's properties that we want to maintain, we've identified that having this Witter ionic head is going to help get that aqueous layer on top of the fuel faster. And so there's some stuff that maintains for my defense that isn't as important. But what we wanted to see was why the cationic head um, was more stable than the Zwitter ionic head. So we were able to shine some light through um, this solution. And as we shine light through this solution and we spun this solution around in a circle, we were able to take those assembled worm-like micelles that all were misconformed and unaligned in solution but then when you start to push them all in the same direction, kind of like logs floating down a river, eventually all those logs start to line up. And as those logs with the cationic surfactant started to line up, it formed these very stable structures inside of it that made the foam not drain as quickly as you're spraying that foam through the nozzle. Those are the logs going down the river and you're aligning those uh, molecules and making them more stable, um, which these wood ionic surfactant didn't do. So now we've kind of identified this part of, of PFAS doesn't drain quickly and it doesn't drain quickly because under um, those uh, shear forces as you're flowing it in a single direction, it doesn't form any stable alignments where some other surfactants do. And so uh, with that, I just wanted to give a shout out to things I'm excited about while visiting Blue Hill um, and my time up here um, that I think it's, it's important to kind of recognize. I, I'm doing some pretty hard stuff, mixing plastic together and trying to make some new soap. But I think the more important stuff and the more impressive stuff is what people can do as a society and as a community to try to address this issue and, and play the part that everybody can play. And so something that has confused me, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I went to school in New York. So I was used to bringing my water bottles back after um, my, or other uh, liquid containing cans after college parties. Uh, to the distributor and getting my five cents back. That seemed like it should be a normal thing, but Connecticut, New York, and Maine are like the only states doing it. So I think it's important to realize that just having this infrastructure and having some system where there's a little bit of an incentive to bring your plastic water bottle, any of your returnables to a center that is capable of collecting these in a single waste stream. It's very hard to separate these on the molecular level, but if everybody can do their part separating it on the macro level, it's gonna make my job a lot easier. So I really appreciate that Maine retains the, the deposit and the, the return fund. And I think that's something that 
other states should continue to look at as a good way to have the, the difficult to separate waste stream maintained in, in one system. And so it's also really nice to see that expanded throughout the community. This was at the, the co-op where there's both a returnable and a recycling thing. So further separation of things that we're able to um, recycle helps downstream a lot because a lot of the problems and why the research we're doing in recycling comes from places that don't have these infrastructures in place where it's very easy to recycle a plastic water bottle if the only thing I have to deal with is a plastic water bottle. So it's, it's really nice to have that return to the right location. Similarly, it's really nice to have a, a great connection um, of just local food, local ingredients um, here at the Blue Hill Wine Shop where no need for packaging on the plates. Just if you want the sandwich, you can buy the sandwich. Similarly, we don't. We have reusable containers for the peas. Um, and then cheese is a magical food itself. It builds its own packaging sometimes if you let it sit there long enough. So I think there's a lot of great examples in nature of, of things that were already working and systems that were already in place that we don't need to deal with too much. Um, and lastly, the, the Shaw Institute and, and the interns, um, I was with Charlie yesterday, and I got to go to um, Turnstile with one of his interns, and they're starting a project to collect shirts that aren't being used um, and aren't going to be put on the racks at Turnstile, collecting those shirts and then turning them into yarn, um, which is an easy recycling strategy that can be done on the t-shirt level that doesn't have to be brought all the way back down to molecules. But if you can get some more use out of the product you already have, that's always good. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank yeah, the Blue Hill Co-op, Blue Hill Transfer Station, uh, the Blue Hill Wine Shop, Turnstile, and of course the Shaw Institute for, for really providing great examples within the community of things that, that I think are very encouraging and that should be expanded to other areas of just kind of caring about the environment you're in, respecting the things you're using and doing your part to help out with the problem that we're all facing. Um, so thanks a lot. And I also wanna thank, um, some of the people I've worked with and this uh, the strategic environment environmental research and development program which paid for grad school for me so a lot of thanks for them uh, <laughs> and with that any other questions yes Trent. how can you be sure that when you replace something bad with will also not be bad because sometimes we see these replacement You're right. things that <laughs> think just as bad as the thing that they're replacing. So that is, that's the question, right? And I think the answer is patience. And I think that that's something that, that there's not a lot of room for um, where we exist right now. And I think that's kind of what happened with the fluorinated surfactants. We got to, oh, this is solving the problem. Make all of it as much as, it, as you can. And we don't care about what happens where, a lot of my research, I'm the stuff I'm making, I'm not trying to not trying to sell, I'm not trying to say this is the be all end all, but I'm trying to identify the things that we can look at from a physical chemistry perspective in the design of these materials. And I think back to the patient's aspect, there needs to be a lot of work done before things are released at a public scale. And I think that's something that that isn't done. Oh, excuse me. Too much cheese. Um, so I think what, there's a little bit of patience that needs to be done before implementing a new material. It's really easy to say, oh, we fix this one problem, send it out the door where I think it, it's important to not play catch up the entire time we're making new materials and to, to have a little pause before throwing something out there to actually have systems in place where we can do um, extensive and comprehensive research before trying to replace something. So. I think there's there's definitely the patience game of, okay, we've made this and it's better, but it's better at what we're replacing it for. And let's not just replace it because it's different. Let's actually make sure it's better. So I think it's it's having those those research projects done before it's too late, which is very uncommon. And that's just something that that I wish I had more power to over to control. But I think that, yeah, having just the awareness and the thought that just because it's different doesn't mean it's better. Um, but that everything needs to be questioned pretty extensively before being thrown into our environment without much care. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know if you can see these little walls that are coming together. <laughs> yeah, I've been staring at these things for too long. You actually see them? <laughs> so yeah, that's what, so this... Um, and you've got a machine that you can see these things. Yes, so that's... Um, so you put them up to your eyes and you see these walls. So, sort of. We gotta, we gotta get some steps along the way. So what this is, this is about 20 millimeters across. Um, so pretty small, but, but pretty significant. It's about this big. It's about the size of a quarter. Um, so this is about the size of a quarter. And these structures that are aligning themselves are probably about like 500 nanometers. So to make sure that we can see them, we hit them with light that is about 500 nanometers. And if light is 500 nanometers and it hits something that's 500 nanometers, it scatters it. And as it scatters it and changes the direction it's going, um, we're able to see how it changed direction by putting on little cross polarizers. So we have one, one window before the camera, well, sorry, one window before the sample that puts all the light in one direction. And then we have another light window after the sample that stops all of the light that was going that direction. So if there's anything inside the sample that scattered that light and changed the direction it was going, we're now able to see it because we blocked out all of the light. We put all the light in one direction, blocked it all. And then by seeing the light that's coming through, we know there's something in there that is big enough to be scattering the light that we were um, putting through it. <laughs> actually seeing them, you're seeing the result of some action on them. Pretty much, and that's exactly we're kind of staring at shadows. That's at shadows. <laughs> that's all we're doing. Yeah, they like quote that. Plato instead of me. That's the <laughs> yes, Carla. Question from someone up here. I apologize. This is probably someone in your space, so this is um, okay. Uh, but someone much smarter than I am. Um, why not use Why not use a geminal strip back into the form of Esther? Yeah. And this is probably what you're doing. Who is this? Is this Jose? All right, so first, a, a Gemini surfactant for everybody who's not um, a surfactant or a chemist or a surfactant chemist's roommate is my guess. Um, so while these had a single tail, um, a Gemini surfactant has two tails and two heads, but they're still brought together. Um, so I don't have any of those drawn in this presentation but it's essentially taking two surfactants and tying them together at the heads. And so I've done some research on Gemini surfactants and I have seen that they're very exciting. Um, so I think that the Gemini surfactants are exciting because of the shape that they occupy and that it's much easier to get to those vesicle shapes that PFAS already makes so that we're able to have a self-assembled structure very similar to what PFAS is doing using different starting materials, but kind of rethinking the shape of that, of that molecule. I think that was uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> he passed the test, right? <laughs> yeah, no further questions or answers about that. Yeah, awesome. that's it. I really appreciate you all coming. Maybe we'll be around for a second like, to ask a question, but thank you again, Dave. <laughs> and again any other questions i'm happy to to discuss <laughs>